Well, hello, and welcome back to our study on the book of Revelation. Once again, my name is Dr. Daniel Sloan. I'm the associate pastor here at Safe Harbor. And thank you for joining us as we continue our study through the book of Revelation. This week, we will be looking at Revelation chapter 6. And this is where we start getting into the idea of the judgments that will be coming during the tribulation period. So this is kind of where people start to get uh, into some of the weeds. And like I said it back in the first video in Revelation chapter 1, we're going to look at what does the Bible say, some, how could this play out, but we're not going to get tied into all the kinds of different speculation and this and that. Uh, as we go through that. So we'll look at what the Bible says uh, and, and see what are these kind of things. So let's pray and then we'll get started. God, we thank you for this day. We pray that as we look at this chapter and we see your judgments on the world, that we will be motivated to reach the world, God, that, so that people will not have to go through these if, if that timing does happen. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so as we get into uh, the thing, kind of a review, remember chapter 1 is John on the island of Patmos. Jesus comes, he meets with him, and he says, hey, we're going to write this book. Chapter 2 and 3, you have the message to the seven churches that are in John's own time. Chapter 4 and 5, what we saw last week, is John's vision. He goes up to heaven. He sees God on the throne. He sees the scroll. He sees Jesus as the Lamb worthy to open the scroll. And so that leads directly into chapter 6, where we see the Lamb opening the scrolls and bringing out the judgments on the world. So it's not God the Father necessarily who is the judge. It's Jesus who is the judge, who is bringing these judgments on the world. Sometimes people say, Oh, well, the God in the Old Testament, he's this judgmental guy, but Jesus, we, like, we don't like him, we don't like Jesus. Well, guess what? Jesus judges just as much as God the Father. In fact, he's the one who's judging throughout the book of Revelation. So Jesus judges. Now, Jesus doesn't judge unfairly. We'll see as we go through the book, he, he offers salvation to all, even during this time. And yet, we'll see there's constant rebellion and, and, and turning away from God even during these judgments. So one thing that we need to address before we get into the seals is what is the timing elements that are involved in these? And this gets a little complicated. Now, in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel 9, verses 24 to 27, it's called the 77's passage. Or the 70 weeks of Daniel uh, passage is, what, is how the King James refers to it. It talks about there's 69 groups of seven that lead up to the first coming of Christ. And then there's one seven left that the Antichrist figure appears in. And so this is where we get the idea of a seven-year tribulation period. It's from Daniel Nine. And we did that. We covered that about some about last year during this time. You can find it uh, on our YouTube. If you go back, you'll find our study on the Book of Daniel. And we spent a whole uh, a whole lecture going through and seeing uh, the Daniel nine passage. Uh, and so you can go back and look at that. But that's where we get the idea of the seven year tribulation. Now, when do the seals start? We do not know. There's not any timing elements in this. So if the seven-year tribulation starts at the rise of the Antichrist, we're going to see the first seal is this Antichrist figure. So does the first seal start, and that's the beginning of the seven-year period, or is the seven-year start and then the Antichrist comes out? There's not any timing, specific timing elements that are involved in this. It doesn't say... And three months into the tribulation, that happens, or anything like that. So there's some debate on when do these all happen. Uh, but it seems clear in the text that the Antichrist figure does show up very quickly into the tribulation, and in fact is kind of the, the catalyst of the tribulation, period. Uh, and so we'll see that as well. But that is the one of the, the kind of trickier areas in this. 
So first it says in verse 1, Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals. Remember, we had the, the scroll, and he's opening the seals so he can read the message. And I heard one of the four living creatures, those are the creatures that we saw earlier last week, uh, with a voice like thunder saying, Come, and I looked, and behold, a white horse, and on its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. So the idea, who is the, so you have that, who is the white rider? Uh, some people mistakenly say this is Jesus, because they look and say, oh, there's a white rider in chapter 6, there's a white rider in chapter 19 who is Jesus, so this must be Jesus. But there's a couple problems with that. One, Jesus is the one opening the scroll, so it's like, Jesus opens the scroll with a seal, and it's himself that doesn't really fit. Also, we're going to see Jesus, when he comes, he has the sword out of his mouth. This guy has a bow, so it's kind of a distinct uh, thing. Uh, and it says he was given a crown was given to him. The crown is a different crown. It's not a diadem that Jesus wears in 19. It's called a Stephanos crown. It's a different kind of crown. It's like what they would wear at the Olympic Games back in the day when they won. And he came out to conquer, conquering and to conquer. So this figure is what we would call the Antichrist figure. We're going to see him specifically again in chapter 13. And in that passage, he is referred to as the beast out of the sea. He's actually never called the Antichrist in the book of Revelation. That comes from the book of 1 John. Uh, but he has a lot of different names in the Bible. Uh, he's called the Antichrist. He's called the beast out of the sea. Uh, he's called... Uh, the prince who is to come in the book of Daniel, uh, he's called a lot of, he has several different names throughout the book. Just kind of like Jesus has many names, Satan has many names, the Antichrist has many names. But he is a figure who comes and controls the world during this time. He's the one government figure. He's called the man of lawlessness in 2 Thessalonians 2. And we looked at 2 Thessalonians uh, last year as well. We've kind of, this is kind of the culmination of all these things that we've been studying over the last few years. And so he is uh, this figure who is conquering. He controls the entire world, as we'll see in chapter 13. So he is a conqueror. Uh, he is the one world leader who is able to do uh, whatever he has. Now what's interesting is, in chapter 13, we'll see he is empowered by Satan to do this. But here, Jesus allows this to happen. He opens the seal and allows the Antichrist to come to power. And so, Satan is not doing anything that God has not already enabled him to do. Satan does not have power to overwhelm God. God has to allow him to do these things. So this Antichrist figure comes out. Why is he wearing white? Two reasons. One, he is a false Christ, the Antichrist. Uh, and so he is trying to be a false Christ. And we'll talk about that again in, in chapter 13. Also, in John's day, there were people on the outskirts of the Roman Empire called the, Parthen the Parthenians. Uh, the Parthenons. And they wore white and they were known as fierce warriors and the Roman they were actually people that the Romans could never conquer the Romans basically conquered everybody but they can never take out uh, these people and so they're kind of known as warriors so that's another reason that he might be wearing uh, this white and so he is the first of what we call the four horsemen of the apocalypse that he takes over then we see uh, verse 3 when he, Jesus, opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come, and out came another horse, bright red. Now the other three horses, the, the first horse is the Antichrist, who's an actual person. The other three horses are representatives of what he will accomplish and what will happen during this time period. This bright red, 
its writer was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people should slay one another and he was given a great sword so you see this first antichrist figure comes and in fact in the book of daniel chapter 9 verse 27 it says he makes peace with israel with with the people with people what he makes a covenant with the nation of israel and so uh, it's like the antichrist comes and at first things are going kind of well peace is established it's kind of going good Maybe the first year. We don't know the timing of these. Is, is, is it the first seal is the first year? The second seal is the second year? We don't know how long these things happen. Uh, but regardless, eventually war is going to come during this time. And so you have war uh, that, this, that breaks out. Uh, and then it says, when he opened the third seal... I heard the third living creature say, Come, and I looked, and behold, a black horse. And its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarii, and three quarts of barley for a denarii, and do not harm the oil and wine. So what you have here is, the third, uh, the, the third horseman of the apocalypse, the black horse, represents famine, uh, plague, inflation, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's tough to get food during this time period. Now, something that's interesting is, and I just wrote an article about this for one of the newsletters I write for, the pandemic, the global pandemic that we went through this last year or so, uh, has caused massive famine throughout the world there there's more people are starving and having hunger issues today than uh than it has in decades because you've had lockdowns you've had people getting sick you've had all this kind of thing and so there's a food crisis going throughout the world now in america we don't feel that as much uh, although we are dealing with the inflation issues uh, with the cost of food and stuff growing up uh, but in other parts of the world, it's almost impossible to even get food. And so we've seen, we just see a, a picture of that with this global crisis. Now imagine if there's a global war, like what it sounds like in the second seal, what happens after war? Famine, disease, plague, all these kinds of things happen after war is because everyone's been, no one's farming, everyone's destroying stuff now and destroying everything. And so it leads into this great um, famine, uh, inflation, all these things that will occur uh, during this time. And so you, we see, we've only seen a glimpse of what this would look like uh, through our own pandemic uh, that we've been dealing with. Then he says, uh, when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, come. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed at him. And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, and with famine, and with pestilence, and by wild beasts of the earth. So you have kind of a distinction between these four and the rest of the seals. And these four are basically told... Uh, between the, the Antichrist of power, the war that occurs after that, the, the famine, and then the death, that eventually one-fourth of the population of the planet will die during this time. One-fourth of the population. That's what it says. It says uh, over, he was given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with a sword and with famine, with pestilence, and by wild beasts. Now, think about that in terms of the sheer numbers of this. We, right now, there are between 7 and 8 billion people on the earth. Now, if you say, all right, if the rapture happens beforehand, uh, then and there's, you know, I don't know how many, how many people would actually be raptured up. You know, there's 2 billion people who claim to be Christians, but we know that that's not the case. Let's just say there's a billion Christians who are raptured up uh, if that happens before the tribulation. 
Then you're talking about, if this were to happen today, you have 7 billion people, or 6 billion people, however you want to say it. If a fourth of that, you're talking about over a billion to 2 billion people dying during this time. And this is just the first judgment. We're going to see that it get worse. It progressively worse. And so during this time, literally billions of people will die. And that's if the population is today. If the population continues to grow, it could be even more uh, in the future. And so you see how bad these, these seals are, that billions of people are dying. Now, how will this happen? We'll see as we get to, when we get to the trumpets and we get to the, the bowl judgments, that a lot of these judgments kind of sound like nuclear war. They talk about the, the, the oceans are poisoned, the lakes are poisoned, there's all the grass gets burned up. That kind of sounds like nuclear war. Now, if this happens in the future, and maybe nuclear wars are out, but and this is why I don't want to get too much into speculation, but it could be this, I mean, we see the red horse, if, if there's a world war, eventually with all the nukes on the world, somebody's going to start launching nukes. I mean, if, if people get attacked uh, and these kind of things. And so this is probably what happens. To, to kill billions of people, you're going to have to have uh, something like this that will happen. Some kind of mass destruction on a major scale. Weapons of mass destruction uh, that we've never seen used. And we've seen two used at the end of World War II, very limited. Uh, use, but imagine if people just start launching these kind of things off at each other, you would see devastation that the world has never seen uh, and through this. Also, what we'll see as we go through is some the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls are chronologically in order. They're not, sometimes people will say, oh, the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls are the same judgments that John is just kind of rehashing the same judgments. No, chronologically, they go in order. The seals lead into the trumpets, the trumpets lead into the bowls. So these are 21 unique judgments that are poured out. It's not seven judgments that John refers to three different times. It's 21 different judgments that are brought on the world during this time. And so, why is Jesus doing this? Because he's given the world as much of an opportunity as he can. I mean, and we'll see that even in chapter 7 next week that people are saved out of this. Uh, but eventually God says, all right, I've given you enough time. Judgment must come at some point. And we'll see that through this. And so judgment is coming. Then he says in verse uh, 9, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. So you have the fifth uh, seal is not really a judgment per se. It is actually uh, kind of a, a, a realization that during this time, there are going to be martyrs that die. And we'll see that throughout. But you might say, well, how can there be martyrs? Well, there we'll see. There is a great uh, harvest, soul harvest, that occurs during this time. So it's not just about judgment. There are millions of people who are going to get saved during this tribulation period. It's like the, the light finally clicks and they get saved. The problem that arises is once they are saved, they become enemies of the Antichrist and his power of enemies of Satan and the false prophet and stuff. And they will be persecuted during this time. And so they will be killed and there will be a great persecution. Uh, think of it like uh, what is happening in China and some of the, in India and some of these places where they constantly are persecuting Christians. 
Think of that also. the authority of Satan at, during this time and his and his player, the Antichrist, and they are constantly persecuting Christians. If you are not on their side, they will kill you, uh, no questions asked. And so these martyrs are saying, hey, God, how long are you going to allow this to continue? When are you going to take out Satan and the Antichrist and these and the false prophet who we haven't been introduced yet to and these people who are constantly uh, destroying us and persecuting us and doing all that they are doing? And God tells them to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete. And he gives them a white robe. So they, are, they get the white robes, and we're going to see other people get the white robes as well uh, later in the book. And so it's like God is saying, look, I'm just giving them a little bit longer. You might say, well, why is God allowing that? Because people, well, let's see, as we see next chapter, next week, people are still getting saved. So sometimes people will say, well, why doesn't God just, even in our own day, well, why doesn't God just come and end the world? Why doesn't God just come and bring judgment? Why does God allow all this evil to happen and all this stuff to happen? Why? Because he knows that even though evil, yes, evil happens in our world, and yes, evil, great evil is going to happen during the tribulation, there's still people who are taking that chance to get saved. And if God were to come and just wipe everything out, those people would not have a chance to, be, to receive salvation. So God's patience allows for more people to get saved. However, God's patience also allows for bad things to continue to happen. It's kind of a catch-22. If, if God were to come in and wipe everybody out, all the bad stuff, people would not have the opportunity to get saved. So he has to have patience to do this. Uh, during inside, but we see there's a long, uh, a lot of uh, martyrs uh, during this time. And we're going to see them again uh, in the next chapter. Then verse 12, it says, When he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth, the full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. So you have this idea of this massive earthquake, something the world has never seen before. Uh, if you've ever lived, if you lived out in California or something, you know about earthquakes. But this is an earthquake unlike everything, anything the world's ever seen. Now the idea of the, the moon becoming like blood, the sun becoming black, uh, the stars of the sky fell to the earth. Is that literal? That the moon's going to turn to blood? The sky will be black? All this kind of stuff. I, I don't know. I think it, probably what John is saying is, from his perspective, that's what it looked like. But if you think about it this way, if there's already been all this war, there's already been destruction, now you have a giant earthquake. What happens if there's a giant earthquake? There's mass chaos, mass destruction. There's going to be explosions. The, there's going to be smoke, there's going to be pollution, there's going to be all kinds of stuff. So you're going to have, I mean, think about it, if you go into a, a city and you look up and you don't see that many stars, it seems like, hey, where did all the stars go? Because you're in all this city pollution and, and, and city light stuff. Well, if you have this massive earthquake, a global earthquake, it destroys literally millions of things, you're going to have pollution all over the place. You have all kinds of smoke and clouds and fire and everything. And that was probably where this idea of uh, the stars not being able to see the stars, barely being able to, the moon, uh, the sun, everything, it's because of the destruction that's occurring on the earth. Uh, and so that's my opinion on that. Some people say, no, 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 the moon has to turn to blood and this kind of stuff. But I think it's more so from the, the catastrophic, catastrophic events, try to say that word, catastrophic impact of the world, the environmental impact that's occurring during this time that's causing these things to occur. But then you have one of the 
saddest passages, and we're going to see this several times throughout the book of Revelation. Think about it. These people are going through judgment by God, this destruction, this thing. But look what happens. You think, okay, God is bringing judgment on them. They're seeing this. Maybe they're going to finally turn and worship God finally out of all this. But look what happens in verse 15. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? So instead of saying, let's worship God, let's fall down and worship God, let's 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 turn to God, it's now let's go hide in the caves, let's go and, and say who can stand, but you still see they will refuse to repent. They refuse to turn back to God. They they would rather have the rocks fall on them and kill them then repent and turn to God and we're going to see this throughout the book of Revelation the depravity of the human heart that some people no matter how much God does no matter how much uh, justice he gives out no matter how much patience he gives out no matter how much anything he does they will just not turn to God they, they, their heart is hardened. They're like Pharaoh in the book of Exodus. God comes to Pharaoh ten times and says, hey, I'm going to do this unless you change your mind. And Pharaoh goes, nope, not changing my mind. And then God does it. And then the next time, I'm going to do this unless you change your mind. Nope, I'm not going to do this. And you see Pharaoh just keep hardening his heart, hardening his heart. He just hates God, doesn't want anything to do with God. That's what you get in this picture. The Antichrist, his followers, like sometimes they're called the earth dwellers in the book. They just will not repent. They will not turn back to God. They, they would rather die in their sin than have anything to do with God. And it even becomes clear in this. It says, uh, Hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. So you kind of have this idea that like they know these are not just cataclysmic things. They know that this is the judgment of God almost. They have some kind of awareness of this. It's almost like they realize this can't happen naturally. This has got to be God bringing judgment down upon us, and yet they still refuse to listen to God. Still refuse to repent. And so we see by the time we get, now we won't get to the, the seventh one until uh, chapter eight, uh, but by the time we draw the line here, you have these massive devastation. Now we're only a third, basically a third of the way through the judgments of judgment, and yet we've already seen the Antichrist has come to power, war has broken out, famine and pestilence has broken out, a fourth of the population of the world has been destroyed, persecution against believers uh, is at an all-time high. And now you have a global earthquake that's occurring. Uh, now, people want to ask the question, where did the martyrs come from if the tribulation, if the rapture occurs before the tribulation? Where are people going to say, now, that's a good question. If the rapture occurs, everyone gets saved. Everyone that's saved is raptured out before the tribulation uh, and is in heaven. But after the once the tribulation starts, there, there's still Bibles present. Uh, there's still probably a lot of people who thought they were saved or, or kind of played the game with God and then all of a sudden realized they weren't saved, that could get saved uh, through this process. And that's who the martyrs come out of. We're also going to see in the next chapter, there's a, these Jewish witnesses that are going around preaching the gospel. So there is... The ability to get saved during the tribulation, that doesn't mean that the, the, these are church believers. The church has been raptured out, is what we will say uh, from this. But even if it's not, you have the idea of 
persecution is on the rise. The, the power of this is coming. And so all these judgments are, are being laid out uh, during this. Now, if we're going on the seven-year timeline that we get from the book of Daniel, we're not even three and a half years into the, rap, into the tribulation at this point. This is in the first, roughly the first three and a half years is the seals and the trumpets. The bowls are kind of the last three and a half years where things really amp up and get bad. Uh, and so we're, we're just starting this, this process as we go through this. Uh, and, and people say, man, this sounds really bad. Why is God doing this? Well, remember, God has to deal with sin. And if God has to be a judge of sin, these people are continuing their sin. They're not repenting. They're not doing this. And so God has to do this in order to judge the world uh, for the sin that it has brought about. So next week, we'll kind of take a break uh, from the sealed judgments. And we're going to look at a different passage in Revelation 7 that deals with salvation and, and what's occurring during this time. Uh, there's a couple different places in the book of Revelation where these kind of interludes happen. Chapter 7 is one. Uh, chapter 12 and 13 is another one. Where it's almost like the devastation and the judgment is so bad that John is seeing that he has to like take a mental break. That I, can't, I can't see anymore. And jo God gives him these other visions uh, of this that he can kind of take a mental break and say, okay, this is what's happening. All right. And then he goes back to the judgment. And then, and, then we take over, and then back to the judgments. And it's almost like God knows, man, you just keep reading it, it gets bad. And so he, he kind of puts these interludes in for us. So we'll pick up that next week. Hope you'll join us again.